I am Norma. I was named by my father and the meaning of the name Norma is the teacher. And it has certainly turned out to be exactly that. In the early 1960s, yes, the 1960s, I had a near death experience. And at that time, I was 26 years of age. And I lived in London, England. I was married. We had one child, the very first child. And um, for about a month, I was um, not feeling well at all. And so I was on and off uh, from work. And doctors did not seem to know what was wrong with me because I did not have the usual signs of pregnancy. And so I was out for about a month on and off. And then even though I was not feeling well, it was time to return to work. And it's Monday morning and I um, leave my baby, my son, with his babysitter. And I make my way to work uh, in the city of London. I get to work and throughout the day, I am experiencing excruciating pain. At about four o'clock in the afternoon, I look at the, the time, I look at the clock because we're scheduled to leave at five. And it occurred to me that the pains I was experiencing felt like labor pain. So I asked to be released early, stepped into the elevator and there was one other person in the elevator and she was a Hindu young woman. Her name was Selena. I did not know Selena at the time and we were the only two people in the elevator. And in those days in the 1960s, elevators um, stopped with a jerk. And when the elevator stopped with a jerk, it seemed like all hell broke loose and the pain intensified and I collapsed. Now, Celine got very busy and she uh, attracted some other people and um, they hailed a cab because the hospital was just a few blocks down the road and they managed to get me into the cab. Somewhere while I was in the cab, I kind of came back into semi-consciousness and she asked me, she said, what's your name? I said, my name is Norma. And then I I went back into unconsciousness. They got me to the, to the um, hospital, got me into the emergency room and um, I am, I'm, I'm out of it. I'm totally unconscious. Now, the cab driver who helped her to get me into the emergency room, um, drove away with my handbag in his cab. He was unaware that he had done that and he did return the bag the very next day. But the dilemma that they faced was that here was a patient and all she could tell them was, well, who is she? She said her name is Norma. What's her last name? I don't know. Where is she from? What? Where does she live? Where does she work? Selena knew nothing about me and God bless her. She stayed, stayed. They took a picture of me in the unconscious state and they gave it to the police. And the police set out to try to trace where my abode was, where I lived and, and, and where my family was. In the meantime, I, um, I again come back to, to semi-consciousness for a moment and I'm on a trolley and there are two doctors wheeling this trolley into the operating room. And the doctor explained to me that I have a dead fetus inside of me and they needed to do surgery to remove it. And by which time I, I went back into unconsciousness. The next thing I know is um, the pain is gone. There is no pain. I'm at perfect peace. The only problem is I'm on the ceiling. And I'm looking down at my body on an operating table. <laughs> you talk about confused. I am thoroughly confused. How could I be in two places at the same time? And the fact that I'm on the ceiling looking down and I'm practically no pain at all. Pain is gone. And um, I'm observing the, the nurses moving back and forth to the doctors, you know, handing the equipment they need. And, and, and I'm like, almost freaked out on, on the on the ceiling. And then it dawned on me that since I was no longer in pain, it might be a good idea to let the team know that the pain is gone and there's no need for this operation. And so with that, the thought came to me, uh, how do I get up off the ceiling? And as soon as I asked the question, I found myself on the ground. I'm on the ground and I'm at face level and I'm going, I'm trying the, the, the doctors. I'm saying, hello, can you see me? I am here. I cannot explain what is happening here. I'm moving from one doctor to the other and they don't seem to be able to see me at all. So now I'm moving between the nurses and the nurses are scurrying back and forth. 
and I'm trying to say hello, hello, this is me, um, I'm okay, there's no need for the emergency surgery, etc. And then I discovered that nobody could see or hear me. So then I find myself back on the ceiling and I'm looking on and the graft indicates that I have flat. I had friends who were nurses and I understood what flatline meant. And now I'm really, really confused. How could I be flatline, supposedly dead, but I have all my senses. So when they pick up the paddles, I could see the outline of electricity around those paddles. And again, to tell that I was thinking very clearly and very deeply, the thought in my head, head was, I'm not dead. I don't understand what's going on here. But if they apply that amount of electricity to my body, they will probably accidentally kill me. So is there a way I can get out of here before that happens? And with that thought again, I found myself moving through the ceiling and out into a very, very dark tunnel. The strange thing was I was not afraid. I am still at peace. I feel very light in my body and I'm moving very swiftly, extremely fast through this very dark tunnel. And we come around a corner and when we come around this corner, I could see the end of the tunnel before me. And at the end of the tunnel was this amazing velocity of light. It was like a kaleidoscope of color. And it, it kind of faded into white light as I'm approaching it. It seemed like a kaleidoscope of color. And then it faded into crystal clear white. And the moment as I was about to enter the light, the thought that entered my head was, this light is so uh, bright. The brilliance of the light was so bright that I felt that it would probably burn my eyes and render me blind. I really had that little fear at that moment there that if I survived all this, it would probably, probably blind me. As soon as I entered the light, I felt a phenomenal welcome. I felt like I was embraced by the light. I felt like I had become light. And having become light, I could feel the energy of love a phenomenal level of love that seemed to surround me, enfold me, and I had kind of like woven into and become one with this love. It was, it, it really is an experience that, that, that words cannot describe. Words are totally inadequate to describe the extreme feeling of love, that you're enveloped in love and, and, and this beautiful light that seems to make everything not only brilliant but even the thoughts very brilliant and um the next thought i had was how do i get around here as soon as i had that thought i found myself traveling and i came to a point where i am facing what looked like a large television screen now in the 1960s television screens were very small the screen lit up and once it lit up, it was divided into three sections. Section on the left had a heading that says, the life that I had created. The second column was the way I had lived the 26 years. And the third column at that point was blank. So I'm looking at one column that says, this is your life as you have planned it. The middle column is, this is your life as you have lived it for the past 26 years. And the third column is blank. And then the screen begins to scroll. As the screen begins to scroll, now I can see what it is that I planned. And in the middle column now, I am I'm looking at and revising how I have lived this objective that I set for myself. And then when I turn my eyes to the last column, it says objective not accomplished. And then scroll scrolled up a bit more. And now I'm, I'm out of childhood and I'm more into my, my teenage days. And again, I can see on the left-hand side the objectives that I had set in my plan and what it is that I should have accomplished during those years. Believe it or not, I don't feel judgmental. There's nobody judging what I'm reviewing. But now I'm amused because I'm thinking, I lived for 26 years. How could I not have known what it is that I had set for myself and the fact that it seemed that I had lived the complete opposite to what was contained 
in my life's objective. And the column on the third side really amused me because in each, at the end of each segment, objectives not accomplished, objectives not accomplished. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, wow, that was kind of sort of a wasted, a wasted life. And there were um, things, there were things that I reviewed in the life, in my, the life I had just left, that answered some of my questions about life, life on earth. You see, I was a child who had many, many questions. I was raised in a Christian tradition, deeply, deeply centered in the Christian religion. And I had many, many questions about biblical texts. And so now I am looking at, at the way I live my life and I am discovering that while I believed a lot of what was taught to me, it did not seem to have transferred into my knowing. Now there was one piece of scripture that bothered me since I was nine years old. And that piece of scripture was a piece of scripture where Christ said, I came so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. And I asked every pastor I ever encountered, well, what did Christ mean by that? Because he came, he himself died on a cross and people have been dying ever since. So what did that mean? Or did it mean that when I asked the pastor whether it meant that Christ was perhaps telling us a lie, my mother drew me aside and very carefully <laughs> said to me that I was not to even look in the pastor's direction while we were in church. Neither was I allowed to ask any questions because my questions was beginning to embarrass the pastor from whom I was seeking answers. And so I started to write, write my questions down. But it's one question. As the review of the, of the 26 years of my life came to an end, the question popped into my mind. And um, this burning question, and it seems to me like the burning question now took me to the Akashic record. The Akashic record is the record of everything that has happened in the worlds. And notice I said worlds, not just this world. And um, the outcome and what it has produced in terms of energy in our lives. So now I am drawn to an even bigger screen. And as I stand before the screen, the screen begins to scroll very slowly. And I'm now reviewing six previous lifetimes that I have lived. The very first one is in the very, very, very dark age, ages when earth was very dark and human beings walked around with torches. And I see myself in that lifetime and there is tribal war. And uh, the village in which I lived at the time, um, they were losing. They were on the losing end of the war and they had some very deep concerns about the fact that if women and children died in the war, they would be hard pressed to be able to, um, to rise again. So they mustered as many little boats as they had and they put us women and children in these boats and they pushed the boats out to sea with what little food they had in the hope that we would be preserved. The boat that I was in had 23 other women and it sank and we all drowned, which left within me fear of water and a fear of drowning. The next life that I envisioned was a life as a male. I was a male and I was a warrior and um, seemed pretty good at it too. Then the third life that I encountered, I was one of the women who were at the bulrushes when Moses was pulled out of the water. Another lifetime I lived, I was present when I um, saw myself at the cross as a spectator, screaming, crucify him, which again, brought a lot of guilt. We live in a guilt-ridden world that put a lot of guilt on my soul and on my spirit. And the lifetime that really, really stood out phenomenally for me was to see myself along with my parents who were slaves in the United States of America, picking cotton. I was a child and I, along with my parents, we were in the fields picking cotton. And as a child, I could hear the hooves of the horse. And I, I can also hear the crack of the whip as it hit the backs of those slaves who were not producing or working as swiftly as they could. 
and again experienced tremendous fear knowing that when the mass of man got to me as a child, I could not keep up with my coat and the fear of feeling the whip on my back. And then the screen moved and when it moved, I was at the next life. And believe it or not, I was the white slave owner on a horse carrying the whip and doing exactly to the slaves that which I was so very much afraid of. That one baffled me because I had never been introduced to reincarnation. That was not part of my religious upbringing. And so I was more than a little baffled. How could I be at one point in time a black slave girl and at another point in, in, in time and history, I could have been uh, the, the white slave master. So the, the scrolling came to an end and I'm standing there and again, very baffled, wondering how do I get around in this environment? And again, as soon as I ask the question, I am moving, moving very swiftly. And now I am taken to a river. When I was a child in church, we sang that little chorus. Yes, we will gather by the river. The beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints of the river that flows from the throne of God. On the other side of the river, it was not a very wide river, but on the other side of the river, there were hundreds of saints. And they were all beaming phenomenal love. Oh my goodness, I just felt enveloped in love and, and feeling this love in my heart heart and in my spirit and in my soul and um, recognizing that these were all ancestors and among them were people who I could recognize because they had died in my lifetime. And then my aunt who I was raised between my mother and my aunt and she stepped forward in the river and began to wade towards me as I stepped forward on the other side to wade towards her. And again, this phenomenal amount of love. I knew that my aunt loved me, but I had no idea that her love was so phenomenal. And just as we got to the place where we were about to embrace, she stepped back a few places and she says, I am so sorry, but you cannot cross. And I said, why? And she says, because they're sending you back with a message. And I said, but wait a minute, there are millions of people back there Surely they could find somebody back there and give them the message. She said, no, they would like for you to return with the message. And the message was, there is more to life than meets the eye. Life is, and that word is was stressed. Life is eternal. And the next thing I know, I am falling, falling, falling very, very rapidly and crashed into my body. And even though I was still on the anesthesia, I felt the excruciating pain on my journey back in my body against my will. Now, while the near-death experience itself was quite phenomenal, the light on the other side and the love and the glory, that's the only word that I think halfway can really explain what it is I experienced there. So I'm back now in the body and, and, and I become conscious and I'm in pain and I am definitely not a happy camp. I'm in a room and there is two nurses sitting at a table, but they're talking, they're sharing this conversation. It seemed that they both belong to the same church and one of them went to church that Sunday and the other one was on duty. So the one who went to church is summarizing the summary of the sermon that was preached on the Sunday. And the sermon had a lot to do with preparing yourself so you do not enter into hell. And I am lying in this bed and I am outraged. Why would a pastor be preaching about hell? But I can't say anything because I've got, I've got tubes in my throat, you see, so I cannot explain what it is that I'm feeling. And then it dawned on me. And so, I'm listening to this and, and, and I'm beginning to realize I've come back with some different belief system. Now, when the conversation about the sermon came to an end, they turned on a radio that was sitting there between them. 
and there was softly classical music playing very softly. And I'm lying there and I'm hearing the music and I'm realizing that coming out of this radio, I can see the color of the notes. Talk about confused. I am hearing music. I'm listening to music. I grew up with a lot of classical music in, in my household. But now I can see the color of the notes and I'm recognizing that every note has a color. Every color is aligned to a number. And I'm watching this interaction of, of rhythm, color, and numbers. And I'm absolutely fascinated because it is creating a pattern. And guess what? The pattern is flowing in, into these two individuals who are sitting there working very assiduously with their hands. Then two other medical professionals came along and they stopped to talk to the two young ladies. And what I noticed is that they're also absorbing this phenomenal complexity of, of light, of color, of rhythm, and of numbers. And so my journey began with very, very heightened senses. Now for the next next three years of my life, all I wanted to do was to return, return to the other side where there was this phenomenal levels of love and phenomenal levels of light. Since then, I have um, done a tremendous amount of spiritual work and, and it led me to a purpose-driven life. I asked the question, uh, what is my purpose? And that led me to becoming a chaplain, becoming ordained, becoming a chaplain in prisons and work for 27 years, providing chaplain services as well as therapeutic services uh, to prisoners who were getting ready to re-enter re the community. So it took, it took work, it took time. Uh, what have I learned from my near-death experience that their life is eternal? Love is all we need and that reincarnation is very real and that we, we keep coming back until we learn our lessons and that uh, love is the key to the joy and the happiness that we as humanity seem to seek out. Staring lost up at the sky.